Um, so I now have the privilege of introducing the moderator of the first panel, uh, which will discuss Protecting Clean Athletes, a Legal Discussion of Priorities and Anti-Doping, uh, Brent Nowicki, Managing Counsel for the Court for Arbitration and Sport. First chair. Okay, um, can everybody hear me? Can you speak louder? Okay, so uh, good morning everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here on the third and final day of this uh, PCC conference. We'll start by bringing up uh, the panel, I suppose, one at a time. Uh, Mike Morgan, founder and managing partner of Morgan Sports Law. That's better, thanks. Uh, Morgan Sports Law here in London. Uh, Despina Mavramati, my former colleague uh, at the CAS, who's now a founder of her practice Sport Legis in Lausanne. Uh, Travis Tiger, CEO of USADA in Colorado Springs. And Adolfo um, is from the NFL. And Adolfo, uh, correct me, your title again is Senior Vice President at the NFL? That is correct. Okay, Adolfo Birch, thank you. So, as Michael introduced, our topic is uh, a legal discussion in priorities and anti doping. And I think that uh, everyone. <laughs> Oh, we've already started that. No, someone showed the bottle this morning. Is that why you wanted to? It's a sign. Right? <laughs> <laughs> no, you can see the debate has already started. Um, no, I, I think that the last few days have really uh, have provided us all with a unique opportunity uh, to explore the intersection of sport, science, and the law. Um, I think that the panel here today will help us continue on that journey. And again, as I mentioned, we're going to explore a little bit further the legal side of the, uh, the anti-doping world. Uh, I want to start off with a press release that I actually had read two days ago uh, after I had prepared to say other things. Um, and in the press release, it was a USADA press release. I was struck by a comment made by Travis that I found bold. I think it is the, probably the best way to explain it. And I, and I say bold because you are the CEO of a, a national anti-doping organization. And I think what you've said, and I'm not taking a position whether it's right or wrong, and I would invite my colleagues to, to comment on your position, but I think it's bold because in a strict liability legal system, it raises a question of fundamental change. Uh, by way of background, the press release concerned a case of a Paralympian cyclist in the US who had tested positive for hydrochlorazide, so HCTZ, which is um, a diuretic, as I understand it. And he tested positive at a very low level. And through due diligence, and I suspect cooperation with USADA, it was determined that the source of the HCTZ was a contaminated medication that was prescribed to the athlete by his doctor. It's a very common occurrence. We hear it all the time. But again, what, what, what drew me to it was Travis's quote. And I'm going well, to read it, and then Travis, I'll invite you to comment and maybe explain what led to this case and the efforts you took and certainly, again, to uh, support what you've said here. So, and I quote, while the rules require this case to be publicly announced, we strongly believe this case and others like it should be considered no violation. We continue to advocate in the WADA code review process that quote, again, I, I subquote here, where there is no intent to cheat and no performance benefit an athlete should not face any violation or unnecessary public attention. So in the face of strict liability, Travis, can you explain this quote and a little bit about what led you to those comments? Um, yeah, Brent, and, and, and thanks, and thanks for the PCC for um, this wonderful conference and the open and hopefully honest discussion on some important topics. You know, I, I guess I would start when we talk about the priorities from a legal perspective in anti-doping, I think we have to appreciate and define the rules while there's been a lot of jokes about lawyers over the last few days. You know, it's the rule of play, right? And it's good that there are lawyers involved with uh, crafting the rules, drafting the rules, defending the rules. Um, so at USADA, we look at 
the issue of whether or not the rules are evenly enforced, fairly enforced, consistently enforced as an opportunity to protect those who the rules are there to benefit. And, and clearly, athletes who expect the rules to be evenly, fairly, and consistently applied in their case, who are competing by the rules that are in place to compete clean, expect their rights to be upheld. And I, I think it's critically important that we continue to define the anti-doping fight from what's lost when an athlete is robbed by someone who intentionally cheats. And, and we truly believe it's an injustice, one that can't be tolerated, frankly, in sport. And not unlike you know, any other right fight, civil rights fight, et cetera, the, the rules, the laws have to be equally applied in a fair and consistent manner to all those who expect the rules to protect them. And if not, it, there's, there's inequality, there's injustice, there's not the equal protection under the rules that we expect. And, and that's what we're here to enforce. All that said, the rules have to be fair and reasonable. And from our perspective, to hammer, um, in the same sense, an intentional cheat with a two or four year suspension for something that clearly was unintentional, that had no impact on performance, I think is an unfair position to put athletes. And it frankly you know, creates an environment where athletes are scared. And, and we've unfortunately seen as laboratory processes, I've, I heard you know, recently over the last decade that laboratory, has, laboratory analysis has been able to be a thousand fold, if not more, more sensitive meaning they can see smaller and smaller amounts. We've heard nanograms, picograms, and even things lower than picograms. And, and, and unfortunately, what we're seeing is, whether it's meat, whether it's water, whether in this case, as you refer to, a, a prescribed medication from a reputable source that has no prohibited substances the athlete has been taking for several years, ultimately is determined through an investigation. And look, it takes money and time testing, independent, you know, source sealed, determines that that was the source of the positive, are, are, we, are we really defending a system that is going to hold that person to the same level of sanction as someone that participates in a state-sponsored doping conspiracy? And, and I think the answer has to be no. But unfortunately, right now, with the way the rules are drafted, the, the likely outcome and we've seen just too many of those types of cases, and we feel that it not only erodes the confidence that athletes have in the system, creates athletes, as we heard from yesterday's panel, who are scared, what they eat, what they drink, the medications they take, um, you know, of course, the vitamins and supplements we know are risky, but so I, I think we're advocating and have been advocating on, under the water code review process to lighten up where it's reasonable to lighten up. And not automatically, while strict liability on the offense mm -hmm. absolutely stands, and it's in your system, you're responsible for it, but have some common sense, have some reasonableness when it comes time to looking at the intent and looking at whether or not there was a performance enhancing impact, and, and have, a, have a system that is justified um, with every outcome in every case on an individualized basis. But when you, when you say, you know, have a closer look at it, who are you, who are you suggesting take a closer look at it? I mean, I, I follow your logic and I, and, I, and I support what you're saying. My question then becomes, if we look at the global spectrum of sport and we look at the harmonization of trying to create this equal playing field, whether you're a Bangladesh cricketer or you're an American uh, Paralympic cyclist, who are you proposing take that closer look to make that determination of whether this indeed is the, the non-intentional uh, Mr. Gibbs or someone who's just concocting evidence to slip into that crack that you're, you're trying to put between the door frame? Look, I, I, obviously you have to look at the evidence and the facts. Mm -hmm. And you know, I think most of us who have dealt with these types mm -hmm. of cases, you see a picogram level and someone has bookend negatives and you know, um, you know, something like Osterine or another substance like that is frequently found in, in the chain, yeah. wherever that chain may be. But you go and get the prescribed medication, um, not only the one the athlete was using, so let's assume they fabricated it, but you also independently source it and you confirm through you know, testing that, yes, it contains this contamination at a level that could cause this positive test. You've got sworn testimony that the athlete 
you know, and documentation has been on this medication and has used this medication for a period of time, I don't think there's any question that that's the source. The, the only question is what's the appropriate sanction? Of course, if someone fabricates a story and you don't have proof that that's the source, that, that's a different right. situation and the rules should account for that. But, right. you know, when you've concluded that that's the source and the rules still require a two-year um, or, you know, a year sanction, and the publication that you know automatically requires people to assume they're dopers um, and intentional cheats. I, that's just a system that can't that can't survive. I don't think, and oh. it erodes the confidence that athletes need to have in the system. I want to ask you one more, and I'm going to pass the floor over to to Mike and Despina because I'm I'm curious to see whether they agree with you maybe for once. <laughs> um, can you give me a percentage number? How how many cases are we talking about at least in the U.S. system? Uh, Travis, really, are we talking about? I mean, are we talking about a minority, a majority, or somewhere in the middle? Yeah, listen, I, I think, I mean, I named sort of the categories. I think we've had six, um, Matt or Bill, who are in the room, could probably tell us for sure, but six prescription medications. Okay. And again, from reputable places. Out of how many cases are we talking you about? You know, last year, I think we resolved close to 70 anti-doping okay. rule violations. But you, you had the water case we've seen. You know, I'm not going to go down the kissing case. Paul Green can defend that. Um, but, but certainly, you yeah. know, then you add the supplement contamination cases yeah. into that category, the meat contamination But in the end, Travis, I don't know you, but in the end, I mean, that's six athletes that could otherwise be competing who under the current system Look, we, can't. We came, we came really close to keeping a, a Paralympic snowboarder off the Paralympic team. Yeah. Because okay. of a contaminated medication. And, and, and I've heard this is just a U.S. problem. I think, it's, I think that's inaccurate. The issue is we're taking the time to investigate these cases, mm -hmm. to spend the money to get the products tested, yeah. to determine on an individualized basis what, what was the intent, what was the benefit, and let's put a fair consequence in place. And listen, if we have an intentional cheater, um, we're, we're going to throw the book at them. Okay. But when we're dealing with these types of cases, I, I just don't think the system can currently... Uh, you know, can can exist in the way that it does if we truly want to gain the confidence of athletes to support a system that, you know, is going to unfairly hammer them the same way an intentional cheat. Is well, you, you've tossed the softball in the air, so Mike hit it now. I mean, <laughs> you're you're, a, you're a, 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 a one of the foremost leading counsel on the athlete side. I'd be curious to see what your reaction is to what Travis said, and I suppose you adhere to it, but put it in your words. Yeah, um, yeah, unsurprisingly, um, I do agree to, with, with a lot of what Travis has said. And a lot of the cases that we deal with are exactly those types of cases. And a lot of time, a lot of resource is pumped into those cases. One of the biggest difficulties we have is that ADOs often don't assist. And it sounds at least like you saw they're trying to help. And it's, you know, getting information from the labs, for example, data which might help to prove that it is a contamination case. Or where you have athletes that can't afford to test supplements or can't afford to test water or whatever it may be, whatever the suspected source might be. And, and so that is a real difficulty, for, especially for, for lower level athletes. Um, and you, know, you often hear this thing about, well, you know, it's unfair because some, you know, some of the better off athletes are able to afford to get the best lawyers, they're able to afford to do all the testing. I don't think it's unfair that those guys can do it. It's unfair that those guys at the lower levels can't do it. It's unfair that a lot of the ADOs aren't interested in helping them. Because at the end of the day, actually, you know, and, and, and this is what I think Travis is saying, it actually hurts anti-doping. If you have a case like the, um, the medication case, you have, we had Carl Grove as well. A lot of people would have heard about it, a 90-year-old 90, 90 master's athlete. I think he tested positive for Trembolone, and it was, correct me if I'm wrong, Travis, from meat contamination. Um, and I don't see how that helps antidote. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, that, those kinds of cases make the headlines and, and makes a mockery of antidoping. So, I mean, there, there are a few things in the proposed revisions to the code which could help. You know, one of them is um, on the issue of public disclosure. For minors and for recreational athletes, although I'm not, I'm not entirely sure how recreational athletes is going to be defined. So that's a starting point. So the idea is that may, they may not, it may not be necessary to make public disclosures on some of those cases. So I think that, that helps a little bit. Um, another proposal is to raise or even create 
some reporting limits for some of the substances. So one, one, of the, one of the proposals from the co-drafting team is rather than changing the rules on contaminated supplements, what they're looking to do is they've asked, I think it's ever, they've asked the Wada List Committee to review um, a list of known contaminants. Um, it's not clear to me what those, it'll be interesting to see actually what they consider to be known contaminants. Clenbutrol maybe, maybe hydrochlorothiazide, um, maybe hygienamine, and set reporting limits. One of the things actually, sorry to, to my co-panel, I'll, I'll try and, and stop in a minute. But one of the things that uh, a lot of people don't realize is that um, there already exists some reporting limits. It's not, it's not well advertised, I'm not really sure why. Um, you have two, two lists, you have, um, or two documents from WADA, the WADA technical document on uh, decision limits. And that applies to, for example, endogenous substances, HCG, and to certain medications like salbutamol. But what, so I think that's reasonably well known in, in the world of anti-doping. What's less known, so there's a document called uh, the MRPL, um, which is technical document for minimum reporting uh, requirements. And tucked away right at the back of that document, on the very last page, are reporting limits for certain substances, <coughs> including, to my surprise, cocaine. Uh, oxycodone, um, uh, some of the cannabinoids, um, mm. hygienamine, and meldonium. And so the tools already exist to try and to prevent some of these issues. And what, what, what needs to happen is they, I think, in my opinion, <coughs> is that some of these, which is what I think the co-drafting team is proposing, is that you need to expand that list for, for substances like Lembutrol, for mm -hmm. example. And in some instances, raise the levels of the reporting limit, for example, for cocaine, because for cocaine, it still seems to me that the reporting limit is too low. And that too often, we're getting athletes testing for positive for very low levels of cocaine because it's just above the reporting limit. And we've had a couple of cases here in the UK with four-year bans for cocaine. I challenge anyone in this room to tell me why that's proportionate. Why four-year ban for out-of-competition use of cocaine, not related to performance, sports performance, why that would be uh, proportionate. Mike, can I just interrupt you right there? You, you said that you mentioned the word tools, um, that the tools are already there, OK? And I want to segue off that to a little bit about education. And I think the, the easy thing oh. to say is, you know, do you agree that more money should be provided yeah, for educating athletes? I mean, it's hard, we'd be hard pressed to say no. Um, Frankly, we probably wouldn't be sitting here if that wasn't the case. I want to ask the question to Despina in reverse. Um, in my role at the CAS, let's start date back five years ago, one of the common arguments that we would have from athletes was, well, you didn't provide me with any education. Uh, you didn't make me aware of changes in the rules. Uh, I've been prejudiced because you have the information and you failed to disseminate it to me and my colleagues and therefore, you must hold some of that responsibility. I see that argument less and less. And when you hear it, you somewhat laugh. Because I think, again, we'd all agree that there is a lot of information out there, a lot of information. So Despino, the question is, is to you is, do athletes have a responsibility to educate themselves? Do athletes now have a responsibility not to rely on the, the federations uh, or the governing bodies to provide them with education, but to do more, to be more proactive in their, uh, th their uh, attempt to use the tools, perhaps, that are there, and they just aren't reading them, or they're not being proactive in going on and reviewing different commentary and, and, and the like. And can you comment on, on the role of education and how you see that work through your work with athletes? Thank you, Brent. Uh, so I would start with a major question, which is you know, the topic of our uh, talk today protecting clean athletes, the topic of the entire conference, I suppose. And I, what I noticed the first day of the conference is that what we lawyers think of clean athletes, the definition that we have uh, is not necessarily the same as the one that scientists have. And I was really surprised when I heard in the first day of Jeff's and Paul's session on the cast jurisprudence, um, a scientist say, why do we have to distinguish between uh, intentional and unintentional doping? 
uh, and there were some, you know, questions and answers. And I, uh, I was also surprised by another answer given by another scientist, uh, bringing similarities to criminal law proceedings. Uh, they said the difference between intentional and unintentional doping is the difference, basically, between homicide and manslaughter. And all these things, in the common perception of not only laymen, but also athletes and uh, um, the coaches and uh, scientists, uh, it, there are many characteristics uh, of the disciplinary proceedings that are the doping proceedings uh, that are very common to criminal proceedings. And we should acknowledge that when we regulate, when we create, when we draft the rules, when we enforce the rules. At all stages, this principle should be kept in mind. Even if we know in the strict meaning, you know, disciplinary proceedings, doping proceedings are not criminal proceedings. Now, the question is, what is a clean athlete? If you ask the audience, they might say is the one, the innocent one, the non-cheater, if we follow the, you know, the definition of the 2015 WADA code. I would say, from a strictly legal perspective, is the one that has not been caught doping or has, uh, or has been exonerated for uh, an infraction or whatever. <clears throat> to the extent you know, that, this, that there has not been a final decision, we should treat all these athletes as innocent, as clean. And that makes the, the you know the, the that makes the whole distinction to, in the way we treat clean athletes. Now the, the other point is with with respect to um, education. Uh, I sit on several tribunals, uh, anti-doping hearing panels, and if we don't take you know cases before CAS or you know high-profile athletes that are represented by stellar counsel and can dispute basically anything. We do have so many athletes that go to the first instance tribunals of the federations, and they are in complete ignorance of their basic procedural legal rights. And I would stick to that, because what we usually have in mind when educating athletes is we need to educate athletes not to take a prohibited substance, to do their check, to be vigilant and alert, to avoid taking supplements without controlling with their medical personnel first. I would mention something different in terms of education, which is the legal, not legal education. We wouldn't expect athletes to know everything legal. I mean, it's difficult even for us lawyers to be updated and aware of all the latest developments with respect to the WADA code and all the technical standards that go with them, with it. But I would, I, I, I was surprised in a recent case I had sitting on a tribunal of an international federation an athlete would not, for example, even uh, uh, argue uh, the right to um, avoid the retroactive disqualification of the results, which will happen, you know, like the, the, the sample um, uh, was tested two years before the actual hearing, which is a long time. You see, there are some, some things that athletes should be aware of. And uh, I think at that point, we need to educate athletes more. We need to simplify this knowledge and make them aware of all their procedural rights. I, mean, I, I, I like how you've drawn the distinction between education as it relates to, uh, we'll just say, prohibited lists in, in the WADA code and their procedural rights. Because I agree with you, there's two separate uh, sources of education there. But just go, if you can, wh whose responsibility is it? Because my question really was, was trying to get at whether the athlete has some onus to, to educate themselves. And if you agree or you don't agree, I, I'd be curious to know. And, and also, you know, if it's not the athlete, who, who is it? Is it, the, is it the NATO? Is it the IF? Is it the NF? I mean, who is it that is supposed to be taking the lead on providing them with the procedural education you're referring to? Well, education can never be enough if we take that approach. But on the other hand, if we follow the wording of the WADA code, then it's definitely the athlete's responsibility to know what they ingest, what comes into their system. Uh, I would say that things, as Mike said, have become so complex. And uh, uh, it, also, it is also a legal problem, apart from being a, 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 a real problem. You know, it's, it's a legal problem that athletes come to CAS, come to the tribunals of their federations and contest uh, cases at picogram levels. And that is the whole thing. The debate starts from us lawyers, I would say. Well, look, can I Jump in here. I got a lot to say, a lot of thoughts. Uh, <laughs> and I, I, I thought this might be the best time to start talking about some of the things, even going back to what uh, Travis was talking about. And I've been, while people were talking, I, I've been jotting down words. And 
I, I jotted down words like clearly, reputable, common sense, known contaminants, innocent. And I got to tell you, from my uh, sort of vantage point, every one of those words is a little scary to me. Uh, <laughs> because they all involve determinations of either intent or by sort of correlation, credibility. And one of the things that I know from our population at the NFL, our players really don't want us to get into determinations of credibility in particular, intent or credibility. And the reason is, I think, as a you know, unit, and that because they are a unionized membership, they really want to be able to, to know that the all pro quarterback that's making all the money is going to be treated exactly the same as the lowest player on the roster. Uh, and inevitably, when you start talking about things like reputable and, oh, well, I guess his doctor must be more reputable because his doctor is, you know, is one of the highest priced doctors. Or this person, uh, his story is believable. Well, why? He does a lot in the community. He's never done anything you know, wrong. He's never. Uh, had any problems in the past versus a guy that nobody knows. Uh, so I, I, I'm comfortable with the idea of treating differently, but I think it's probably better to look at it in terms of the, the substance and the amount uh, and remove the sort of ideas about, uh, you know, whether we can see that this person you know, was intentionally doing it or not, and whether it's performance enhancement or not, uh, because the performance enhancement itself is only one of the things we're worried about. We're also worried about health of the athlete. We're also worried about their obligation as role models uh, for youth and young athletes. And any of these substances and the use of them causes issues in that respect. So I think we just have to be mindful of all those things. Now, the other thing I'll probably say is that, um, when we're, when we're looking at taking a, a different approach with, on an individualized basis, what are the other athletes going to think? You know, is that, are, are we completely comfortable that everybody, every other athlete that's competing against that person will say, oh, yes, I understand that. That's exactly what happened. I, I get it. You know, or are they going to have some concerns about that? And I, I think that needs to be factored into the equation uh, as you're looking at some of this stuff. Um, and then I would say, finally, we have to be conscious that if you were to adopt that approach, you are going to let some intentional <laughs> cheaters go without penalty. So you have to be prepared to accept that. And we're prepared to accept that in a number of different ways. When we have reporting limits, when we have you know, timing issues, when we have, uh, let's say, a, an issue at the lab with, where a, a B bottle doesn't. Uh, get performed in a timely manner. We have strict limits on when ours have to be performed. Uh, in all those instances, we're potentially saying that someone who has violated will not face a penalty. So I'm not, I'm not suggesting that it's not a basis to do that. I just think we have to be on the same page and understand that if we're getting away from a strict liability, at least for ingestion, and a prescribed strict penalty, whether that penalty is lower or higher for different substances or different amounts, now we're getting into an area where you're, you're asking you know, me as the sort of administrator of discipline to start making decisions that I don't know that everybody should feel comfortable that, you know, that I get to do uh, without sort of a, a, a firmer back step. Yeah, yeah let Kevin. me just jump in. I mean, just, just to be clear, uh, you, know, you didn't write down evidence and facts and conclusions no, I, I, based I, I, on evidence. It's not, I like this person. I'm doing <laughs> no, I, no, but, it, but it's go. some of that, though. It's, and, uh, it's, it's some of that. You, you, you know, panels, arbitrators, or you know, people that deal in the area with the expertise can evaluate facts. It's what lawyers do every day and come to conclusions. And if the conclusion based on the burden, comfortable satisfaction, or preponderance of the evidence in an athlete's, uh, you know, when it's the athlete's burden under our rules, you know, proves uh, by the legal standard that it was unintentional and it was through contamination and the athlete had no fault, 
penalizing them the same for an intentional doper, which is, I think, what you're suggesting, uh, to me, is, is just wrong. I, I think also, you know, in your world, four games for intentional versus inadvertent is, is also something to consider, where we're talking about two years, four years, which can be an entire career, not just, you know, a quarter or less of the season. So I think you have to look at, you know, the proportionality in an intentional and the length of sanction when it comes time to deter the determination of whether someone is, um, you know, determined to be intentionally cheating or, or unintentionally cheating. I, and, and no one is suggesting a, a free pass and that you're letting potential dopers go. I think it's just a, a, a separate analysis on the sanction. Strict liability on the offense absolutely remains, but you're, you're taking in facts and conclusions based on the legal principle to come to a fair conclusion um, that you know is more proportionate than just assuming and then giving uh, an intentional well, cheating. Sound, you know, it sounds to me second. like you may be you may be uh, maybe winning you over to our theory, which is keep the don't have a very low minimum or or you know zero minimum and a four year high. Maybe have something that is applicable to all that's in between. I, and and that you know and and I I I, I also want to kind of push back a little bit on the idea that four games. Our four-game suspension is different than a two-year ban uh, because I, I think if you look at it in the context of how we're structured, uh, one, ours are always games. We suspend based on games. Uh, timing is may be or may not be relevant to a particular player. If a player is suspended in February uh, for six months, he's going to miss less than if he would get a four-game suspension. Uh, and so one of the things we try to do, we've just taken the approach that it has to be games missed and that whether it carries into a following season uh, and, and whether it's postseason, meaning our playoffs and, and, and championship uh, tournament rounds, uh, we require that those uh, matter then. And that, that is a quarter of the season. That's a quarter of their pay for the year. Uh, it's a very significant uh, set of discipline that uh, also, uh, I think, can be reflected by the lack of recidivism. Uh, if, you, if, you, if you have a question about how difficult or how hard the, the, the terms of the discipline are, you would assume that people would do it because the risk wouldn't outweigh the benefit. Uh, so I think you know, our, our system has shown that the four that we do, and that's, we go between two and six, depending on the substance, um, I, I think the, our, our history has shown that that is a that is a, a, a more than adequate deterrent. Yeah, um, but, and, and but I'm not arguing the four the, no, the four I, games. I, I I'm I just it. saying from a from a fairness standpoint, and, and while four games, I think you know four games in the Olympic world versus the pro world is an entirely different penalty, and four games and the money that's lost and you know the the detriment to the player may be totally appropriate in an intentional and in an inadvertent non-intentional situation in, in your world. What I'm saying is you can't take that logic and apply it to our, our world because, you know, two years, four years for an Olympic athlete is, is, is you know, more severe, I think, than the four games. And to give a more severe punishment for an inadvertent that could end up being a lifetime ban is, is just simply more detrimental to that particular person. And so we ought to look at you know, it on an individual basis to ensure that we're not overly penalizing and, and being you know, not proportional um, in the sanction that we're giving. And, and so it's just it's trying to take your four game, you know, yeah. your view of it's OK if it's inadvertent for a shorter period of time. And, and translate it into our uh, Olympic world, and I think it's just tough to do. Well, that, I want to bring the ball back here because there's obviously a, a stark distinction between the world in which Adolfo works and the world in which Travis works. And one of the areas I've always felt a bit sorry for the athlete in is the crossover athletes, the, the athletes who come from Adolfo's world, you know, and then come into Travis's world. And there's two different sets of rules. Um, and the, the ramifications are different for perhaps the same substance or perhaps a different substance that may be permitted in one environment and not permitted in another. Um, so maybe, Mike, could you comment on your thoughts with respect to athletes who come from the professional system who then come into the Olympic system and are faced with um, this imbalance of systems where they can find themselves penalized for something that otherwise would be prohibited? Um, 
you, you know, I think you follow that, that line. Yeah, no, I think so. I think I think you guys did have a situation. Is it Marquise Goodwin uh, a couple of years yeah, ago? Yeah. Uh, Olympic Track and, yeah. long yeah. jumper and, and, and in NFL hockey player. as well. I know there's been problems with Olympian hockey players that come right. over from the NHL right. and, and, and the I mean, list goes on. I, 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 frankly, I, I don't see at the moment a way to reconcile that because the, the two worlds are so far apart at the moment, so far apart. I think that there's probably some very good ideas from the professional sports in the US, the NFL, uh, that could be imported into the Olympic sports. But, but at, at base level, you know, when we're talking about four game bans, for example, and four year bans or, or more, under the new code, there's a proposal to have aggravating circumstances. So that's another two years on top of the four years, so a six year mm -hmm. ban for a first offense. Um, so at, at the moment, it seems to me that, that those two worlds are just too far apart. Mm -hmm. And if an athlete's going to cross over, unfortunately, it's something that they're just going to have to be very careful about. And I, 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 at present, I don't see how, how we reconcile that. I do think that the two worlds could probably take ideas from one another. You know, what, one of the ideas I, I, I wasn't so into a few years ago, and now I'm actually starting to believe it's, it's the way forward in, in Olympic sports is the idea of collective bargaining or unionizing. And, and the problem is, at the moment, in, in the Olympic world, in our, our world, in Travis's world, is that the athlete groups are too fragmented. And it's really difficult to know which athlete groups are standing up for, for, for the athletes as a whole. There are so many groups now. And they don't have a single voice, unfortunately. And you know there will be some um, who will advocate longer bans, lifetime bans, and and they don't always realise um, the nuances of the the anti-doping world. It's not black and white. There is a lot of grey. Uh, you know, Travis has raised some of them this this morning, and I don't think that the athletes are going to get what they want until they sit together, the different groups, and try and work together as a, as a unit, as a, as a collective, and have a single voice. And at the moment, because it's so fragmented, you have some people saying this, some people saying that. No one's, no one's really listening. That's, that's a reality. That is a reality. Do you, um, do you see the same in your, in your practice with, with athletes? Well, you always have differences in the athlete's voice because, you know, you have to deal with different athletes and different disciplines from different parts of the world. So it's the fact of a, a very diverse and fragmented uh, by definition. I think that the IOC Athletes Commission, they are doing some work trying to uh, bring together all Olympic disciplines and, uh, um, and all athletes involved in these uh, sports. Uh, but it's going to be a, a very tough task to mm -hmm. yeah. you know we jumped a little bit ahead of Adolfo. I wanted you can you explain a little bit about the collective bargaining process as it relates to your anti-doping program and the involvement that you have with the union and the players uh, in, in both selection of substances and in the suspensions I mean I don't think everyone here and, and certainly I'll speak for myself is not fully aware of how that process works I think it'd be helpful if you could just set the stage a little bit on the, that, and in particular the health and safety considerations of athletes when when you know entering these negotiations. Well, uh, I mean, look, I, I I think from our perspective, health and safety was the initial consideration uh, that at least the players had uh, as these policies were being formulated back in the late '80s, uh, because they looked around as a group and said, we don't want to have to feel like we need to take something because we see our guy in the locker room or our, the potential person taking my job taking a substance that's, you know, they, they were, we had mm -hmm. players who were certainly showing very severe side effects and health concerns based on steroid use at the time. Uh, so I, I think what collective bargaining allows us to do uh, is while it may be a little more difficult to reach agreement uh, because of the sort of strength of both sides and the, the, the interests of both sides not always being completely aligned, uh, once we do get that agreement, we're able to operate much more quickly with mu you know, fewer disputes uh, and a lot of times with a, an ability to turn over 
scientific judgments to scientists, medical judgments to medical people, <laughs> uh, and then ultimately just leave the legal judgments to the legal folks who are, in our case, every player is fully represented, doesn't have to have a, an education on the procedural requirements because they have a, you know, a, a trained lawyer whose job is only to deal with uh, issues under these policies uh, representing them. Uh, in addition to other hired, they, they may hire other lawyers. But, but so I, I, think, I think for us, one, once you get into the, the collective bargaining system and it can remove you from some of the other issues that you have to otherwise deal with, for the most part. I mean, sometimes we have, uh, you know, one of, the, one of the benefits of collective bargaining from a, from a labor law sense is that it preempts other conflicting laws mm -hmm. that might, you know, in states and other, and other sort of laws that might apply. But because we have an agreement, that becomes the, uh, the, the paramount agreement. So it allows us to sort of separate ourselves out from some potential litigation and other things. Um, and it allows us to do what we want to do. Uh, so if the parties agree that we want to prohibit X substance, it doesn't matter whether a state says, you know, oh, no, that substance, you know, let's say marijuana. We, we, can, we have agreed with our union that marijuana is prohibited and we're going to uh, test for it and we're going to, to take action for those who yeah. uh, who do it. So that's kind of how we... Yeah, to me, this, go ahead. To me this is a really important point yeah. and, and particularly our last conversation about, you know, I started with these unintentional cases that get sanctioned the same as intentional, erodes the confidence in, in the athletes. And, and one of the issues is, in their, in their world, it doesn't erode the confidence of the athletes because the athletes, through their bargaining unit, have agreed that that's the outcome. And so they've accepted that, that situation, where in our world, we don't have that unit that comes forward with the knowledge of, you know, what a picogram or of a particular substance might necessarily mean. Is it intentional or is it inadvertent? And are we going to treat it the same? Um, so I think that's a really important point about you know, that, that to some extent in our world we don't have because it's more of a top-down approach and things like inadvertent sanctions that get the same as intentional are, are necessarily when athletes understand that and see that and, and we do publish all of our arbitration decisions so athletes see, oh my gosh, I can't eat meat when I go to a restaurant because I might have a positive test and get a four-year or two-year suspension, that's out in public and open. And that then incredibly you know, weakens, I think, the confidence that they otherwise have in the system from all the cases that we've seen in the athletes that we've talked to. So we don't have a unit that says, hey, we're fine for you know, four games, 10 games, whatever it is. We're fine, inadvertent, non-intentional, or intentional. Mm -hmm. And we're going to accept that, and we're going to go with it. And I, think, I think that from an athlete, Voice and, and 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 you know mobility standpoint, yeah. which has been a, a common theme throughout this conference. I think that's a really important one. Getting that kind of buy-in into the system that you need, having you know a collective that can uh, agree what's right, what's wrong in, in their eyes, and is not going to undercut the, the credibility of the overall system. This being, I'll give you the, the floor on this last uh, last point before we take some questions. Your thoughts, collective collective bargaining, yes or no. Uh, is there a role for it in the international space? Um, any any final thoughts on the collective bargaining aspect? And the collective about? bargaining uh, aspects uh, uh, that we're talking about is, as I, if I understand correctly, only limited to the United States, correctly? Or what, what is well, your, how things, would yeah. we be able the to problem. connect, as Mike said, it's it's a very fragmented environment and it's, it's extremely dif difficult to bring all these voices together all these different disciplines, th different cultures, different athletes, different priorities. And we saw what happened with the Russian doping scandal where athletes who were not involved would speak against, but you never know what will happen and how an athlete will react un until they're actually uh, personally involved with, with a, a specific case. So sometimes, you know, what you proclaim to, uh, uh, to be in the athlete's interest uh, is not exactly, yeah. Just, Second last word. Yeah, well, sorry, just, the last word. I, I did want to add one thing, sure. and something that Adolfo said that I thought was very interesting, that every, every one of your athletes is going to be represented, come what may. You have a representative for them. And one of the issues we have in, 
in our world, in the Olympic world, is that is not always the case. And one of the, you know, I, I don't like to pick on ADOs, <laughs> but um, if you trawl through the list of cast cases, for example, involving WADA, you'll see over the last few years several cases, dozens of cases, in which athletes from poor countries, low-level athletes from, from uh, third-world countries, have been prosecuted by WADA, and they're not represented by anyone. Mm -hmm. And I don't see how those cases benefit anti-doping. I think it, uh, again, hurts the credibility of the anti-doping movement. I think it hurts the credibility of WADA. Instead of focusing their resources on low-level athletes from third world countries who are not represented, I would have thought it would make more sense for, for WADA and for the anti-doping movement to be focusing on athletes um, who are maybe high level and yeah. who are represented. So that's, that's just one thing I wanted to add because that is a big problem. Your athletes may not have that issue, but a lot of athletes in, in our world do. And, and at the moment, I don't know how we get around that. And it may be some type of collective action um, so that, to ensure that any athlete of CAS is represented. I know, I know you have the legal yeah, yeah. system. I understand that. But not everyone understands that. Not mm -hmm. everyone accesses it. And too often, we see these decisions with athletes you've never heard of, unrepresented, yeah. with four-year bans. Well, I, I, I promised the last word to Despina, then to Mike, and I'm going to take it because I, I do want to save some time for questions. Um, but, but in response to you, Mike, I think, you know, it goes to my question, which was the education. Is do athletes need to start to take more of a proactive role in their approach to their own rights, their own education responsibilities, their procedural responsibilities, as Despina mentioned? You know, for example, at the CAS, we do have a legal aid system. We do have a number of very experienced, and some are in the room, counsel who are willing to take cases on a pro bono basis. We have a fund that's available for athletes to fly to Lausanne to have their hearing. We have a fund that's available to allow athletes to apply to have their experts heard. Um, the money and the resources are available, but it's not our job as an independent institution to, you know, to invite every athlete to apply. They have to have some onus on them to use the tools that are available to help themselves. Um, so I, I parked your question about WADA and its cherry picking of certain cases, but just add that sometimes the tools are there, at least in the cast, and I would invite everyone here who works with athletes to ensure that they are aware of that. Um, I leave it at that, and I'd like to go to the audience if we can. We have about 15 minutes here for some questions, and if, and if we fail to get questions, we'll go back to the floor. Start here in the front. Uh, thank you. Uh, what I think you, it's not. It's there you okay. go. Thank you. Um, I, I may have missed it, but you seem to be going against strict liability principles. And what I didn't hear was if you do want to prove intent, just how you would do it in the international environment. Oh, can I take? Please. So this will bring us to, to the question of intent and how this, you know, if we anticipate the modifications in the 2021 uh, water code, how does this change with respect to the current status? So we, uh, I would say that intentional or unintentional uh, uh, rules violation is the first step from to go from four years to two years, correct? Now, according to the existing rules, um, we don't have the specification whether you have to prove the origin of the source of the substance to benefit from the reduction of the sanction to two years. Uh, how will this change in the new code? Well, uh, I, I would say very little changes will be made because you know the, the code will codify actually the cash jurisprudence that says that you do, you are, it is possible to prove non-intentional rule violation even if you do not prove the origin, the source of the substance, but this will be extremely difficult to do. So which was also the case with the Ademi case at the CAS. Um, now what changes in the new code is the word cheat, cheater, you know, the, the, the one in the definition of intentional um, rule, uh, d d doping violation is uh, the WADA code uh, definition removed the word cheat from its definition, limiting itself to a purely technical definition of intent. Now, how would this influence future cases? 
in your view? What, how do you see it, if I may ask? You know, the, the fact that you remove the word, the word cheat from the definition of intent as a scientist. So I try to anticipate the changes and how this will affect the future cases brought before CAS, and I realize that it actually uh, makes the tasks of us lawyers more difficult to prove non-intentional uh, violations. Why? Because what has been used by CAS panels in many cases uh, before was, well, the panel is not convinced that the athlete was a cheat. You know, we can no longer use that argument because it's no longer in the definition of the WADA code. That's how I see it. But David, I, I would just add, it, when it comes time to the offense, there's no analysis. If the substance is in your urine or your blood, your sample, your matrix, it's an offense. That's strict liability. When it comes time to the sanction for that offense, intent has always been in the WADA code. The, the analysis is, were you with fault, no fault, or no significant fault? That's an, an intent um, you know, measurement, and we can always go down. What I'm suggesting is we ought to be able to go down in those cases where, an athlete, where it's proven, not because we like a person or they, have, you know, they do good things for the community, but based on facts that meet the legal burden, that it is un unintentional, it's inadvertent, they took steps to avoid it. We go down to no offense, no public announcement, and there we have it. I, I guess to, if I followed up, I, I think to me the, the, the answer would be to uh, remain true to strict liability in terms of this is how, you know, the substance has been found in your system, you are responsible for it. What I, the only thing I think where I sort of differ with, with Travis's approach is that I would say you should set in advance what you believe the sanction to be for the presence of that substance at that level and take it away from having to even make a determination about, well, there's a bookend on both sides, so we know, you know, we're pretty clear that it wasn't a residual use, but it was a, you know, one-off internal use. I, w I would feel more comfortable saying a low, which in some ways we already do, right? So for example, with something like, you know, a, a, a diuretic, if that's all we find, the discipline level is lower. It's a, a, a two-game suspension instead of a four. But on the converse, if we find a uh, prohibited substance and a diuretic or other masking agent, we go up to six games. Because now we have made the presumption, and our, all of our, our, you know, our union, the players have agreed that if we see both of these together, then now we, you know, we're, we're basically presuming intent, right? And so to, that, that's the only place where I think, I, I think if you're not prepared to say a low level of, you know, a, no, a low level of a, of a diuretic equals no discipline or equals reduced discipline, generally speaking, then I, that's where I, you're gonna start having questions about this person versus this person and, whether you think this doctor is reputable, what if that doctor is somebody who was unknown to the team? Let, you know, in a team sport, we find some, some guys, they'll go to a doctor and the, the team didn't know about it. They were getting prescribed things that the team didn't know about. How does that factor into your analysis of intent versus not intent? Were they intending to do something and get treatment outside of the context of the team? Why didn't they go to the team doctor and ask for that? So it's, it's a whole lot there. That I think if you you know if you if you kind of push it back to the science part, then then I'm better. Um, let's just go in front here and then uh, work our way up to the top. Just by show of hand, how many questions are there? Yeah, yeah. Not a lot. <laughs> okay, maybe we can just keep our, our answers. Maybe just try to keep them focused yeah. so we can get through <laughs> as much as possible. Not suggesting otherwise, that's, but that's directed to me, right? No, no, not <laughs> <a few. laughs> no. Okay, this is maybe a question for Adolfo. Um, but yesterday, uh, one of the discussion by the scientists was also the protection of health of athlete. Mm -hmm. And going beyond the health of athlete, uh, sports has a powerful to tool to promote health across society. So when we speak about doping and sport, there's also 
this uh, impact on the promotion of health in society more globally. So in, in your system, uh, Adolfo, do you think that the deterrence, uh, when you speak about sanction, do you think the deterrence to use doping in your sport is, is sufficient and to send a message not only to the athletes, but also to the coaches, the medical support, that drugs mustn't be used in sport to enhance performance, but also to protect the health of the athlete and to encourage future young athletes also not to use drugs to achieve an elite level. Yeah, I, 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 in fact, I think if you, if you look at our policy, you will see that the, in, the, in the early parts, it says it's, it's premised on three factors. One is integrity of the competition on the field and maintaining that. And that's not just for the athletes, that's for the public. Because we see, we see one of the benefits of our policy is for the public. Because the public, you know, we're just, if you look at it as a business interest, the public is interested in making sure and knowing that what they're seeing on the field is real. And it's legitimate and it's based on hard work and the, the differential work and abilities of the athletes. Second thing we say is, is to protect the health and safety of the, the athletes. And sometimes that means you've got to protect them from themselves. So mm -hmm. some of the things that are on our list, while they may or may not be performance enhancing, oftentimes people think they may be. And therefore, they may be compelled to try to use them. And so by putting it on the list and treating it as a disciplinary event in the, in the instance of a positive, we're helping them to stay away from the use of those products and with uh, substances. And then the third point would be their obligation, and we consider it an obligation, our union considers it an obligation, for all athletes, include, you know, and plus coaches, teams, we all have an obligation to the youth and young athletes. Uh, and one of the things that we're always concerned about is that even making any changes, what is the message that we're sending to youth what is the message that we're sending to the parents of youth, uh, and how would that impact them? So if, you know, I think the, the, the best uh, thing to look at in that perspective is marijuana. If we take, if we were to say we're not concerned with marijuana anymore, what is the broader impact of that from a health and safety standpoint, not only from our players, but for young people, young athletes, yeah, it, 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 we, 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 we certainly try to make that, a, 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 you know, those three principles are at the forefront of every decision we make. Thank you very much. I would add a little bit more to the confusion. Uh, we had a case in 2014 with a very low level of diuretics. We could prove that it was due to a medication, a painkiller. We could prove that it was the contamination was far, far below the mi minimum required uh, or the, the production limit. So the, the industry did not do any, any, uh, any fault. We could, uh, we could prove that it due to a creation study, I did myself, that it's due to this medication. We informed WADA telling that we should have, as Mike said, we should have some kind of reporting limit for diuretics, and WADA said it's not our problem. It was in 2015. 2016, we published it in a scientific paper, and our discipline chamber in Switzerland said against the code. It's not at all a doping case. It's, it would be against the laws in Switzerland. They said no doping case, it has been published, it had been uh, made public to the International Federation to what, and it was not appealed in CAS. So I'm coming back to my things uh, I said yesterday, we should have it much, much more simply. This example is not in a code. You can't resolve any or every example in a code. So we should go back, you as lawyers should go back and, and to protect clean athletes with just with some kind of, of general rules and then as soon as we have such cases, we should have it made transparent and then build on this uh, the, the laws how, how you judge a case. Yeah. I'm not sure if that was a question or a comment. <laughs> that was uh, a comment and a yeah. question. Could we no, do I it? I interrupt you because we have a lot of hands and we have now two minutes. If, if there's a one final question, this gentleman has a microphone. You get the last word, sir. Thank you. Um, this, this is also more of a comment, basically. Um, uh, <laughs> on the... 
between um, the US sports and the Olympic mm -hmm. sports. Um, I can see, we've, we've heard a lot about collective bargaining and we've heard a lot about game bans. And I can see how um, in sports such as football and team sports in Europe, game bans would work and collectively bargained agreements would work. But when you're talking about things like tennis, where a two game ban might be one tournament and boxing, where a two game ban might be your entire no. year out, the dynamics just don't apply. And the dynamics of cheating in um, a lot of the Olympic sports are very different. I mean, Michael Rasmussen used to peel the labels off his bike to save weight. And when you're looking at that sort of level, substances might bring to that, then the dynamics are very, very different. US sport is very structured. They're in, they all involve teams, and they all have unions that represent them, and while that it applies to football and other sports like that, it doesn't necessarily apply to all Olympic sports. I just wanted to make that point. Thank you. Sir, uh, final question. Please, question. I'm interested, how much of the difference between the anti-doping policies Short of question. the... I got the hook, you know. Uh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, go ahead. How much of the difference in the anti-doping policies is due to the unionization, and how much of it is due to geographic and financial differences? Um, what, what is the vested interest of the NFL, for instance, if there were no players' union? What would the anti-doping system look like? Uh, I, I, don't, I don't think, I think we arrived at a place where we are comfortable that the policy is effective, it provides an adequate deterrent, uh, and it detects and punishes those who violate. And I, I think that, frankly, if, if, if we're looking at it, I remember yesterday there was a conversation about harmonization. Uh, and to me, I think we should focus that not so much on the rules, but on the standards, on the objectives. What is it we're trying to do? And you know, that means, do you have a sufficient amount of testing to ensure deterrence? Do you have a list? of things that are appropriate for, uh, you know, your, at least to make sure that your people aren't getting a performance advantage. Uh, do you have randomness? Do you have, you know, scientific capability to find things? Do you have an intelligence capability to hunt down uh, non-analytical uh, violations? And so when you look at it in that context, I really don't believe there's that much difference between any of uh, the, you know, the, uh, our policy at least, or baseball's policy versus uh, the water code and you know USADA's uh, uh, rules in that respect. Uh, it's it's about tailoring in our case. We're just, in my view, we're just better tailored to our specific population, uh, and that you know, it, I agree with the point made earlier. That may not really apply to every. Uh, group, but it certainly applies to ours, and and that's where I think, you know, when we see differences, that's what I think. Um, listen, I apologize that we have to cut the the morning short, um, but we have to respect our our next panel. Um, I just want to thank the PCC on behalf of my colleagues. Uh, thank you for your time. I I know there's a lot of questions, and I suspect that my colleagues would be more than grateful to answer your questions uh, after the session. Uh, I will pass the floor back to our host, and uh, I believe our task is done. Thank you very much.